This time I'd like to call the December meeting of the Haywood County Board of Education to order. This time I'd like to call on Mr. Jimmy Rogers to lead us in the board prayer, immediately followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Board members, please rise for the board prayer. Let us pray. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the many blessings that you bestowed upon us. Lord, we thank you for the gift that you gave us during this time of year, the, the season of giving, the season of being thankful. Lord, we're thankful for the many things you have given us. And Lord, we pray that your many blessings and your loving arms are wrapped around so many within this county, this state, this country, this nation that have experienced sickness, health, disasters, death. Lord, we pray that you be with this country throughout these times. Lord, we pray especially that you be with our Haywood County schools, our children, our staff, the citizens of Haywood County. Help guide us and direct us and help comfort us when we have times of sorrow, times of hurt, enduring sickness, heal us. Lord, we also pray that you help us do the best that we can to educate children and give them the best opportunities and the best education available. And Lord, we know that you're with us and soon these times will pass. And Lord, help us all as we make decisions for this school system. Thank you again, Lord, for our staff and for everyone that's worked so hard and so diligently and our other county officials, Lord, that have helped us make decisions that help make decisions for the lives of our children and our teachers and our staff. God and direct us, Lord, in all that we do and we'll give you the praise and the glory for it all. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. First of all, I'd like to uh, welcome our newest board member tonight, Mr. Logan Nesbitt, well, he was sworn in earlier this afternoon as being our newly elected board member. Welcome, Logan. We're glad to have you with us, and we look forward to your expertise, and uh, and if I can ever be of service to you or you need help from any of the board members, I'm sure they'll be glad to work with you. So welcome. Glad to have you here. I'd also like to announce that Mr. Henson uh, was not able to be here tonight, but he is uh, calling in, so he'll be uh, able to uh, participate in the meeting this evening. And Larry, just don't let me forget to get your votes and stuff, okay? Yes, sir. All right. He's there. One other thing. Um, The school nutrition winter break meal kits. I'm needed to announce this tonight. There's a free seven day meal kit for children ages one to 18. Uh, this is from our child nutrition program. It's curbside pickup at Canton Middle School or Tuscola High School on Tuesday, December 22nd from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. One box per child while supplies last. For additional information, please contact our uh, nutrition program at 627-1150. That's 627-1150 for the Haywood County Schools winter break meal kits. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? I'd just like to say thank you to the staff that helped decorate for our Christmas uh, board meeting tonight. It uh, it's, looks really nice and I, I appreciate the uh, Christmas spirit. Under agenda adjustments, I know that we uh, need to add an item from Building and Grounds, at least one or two. Is that right? Acting right, Mr. Chair. Sure. Okay. So we'll add it right before the Finance Committee at uh, between 21 and 22. 
we'll call it 21B or something like that. So we'll still get that on there. So uh, they have a couple items they'd like to bring forward to the board. Are there any other adjustments that need to be made? I need to add one for sure. Okay. On uh, with finance. Okay. Possibly two, depending on how the other one goes. Okay. We'll we'll leave that open for one or two items under the finance committee. All right. I need a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Mr. Burmett's made the motion. I hear second. Second by Mr. Clark. Any question or discussion on the motion on the floor? There being none, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. This time I'd introduce Miss Jenny Wood. Lord, it's my pleasure tonight to be able to recognize Ella Larson as our Christmas or holiday card contest winner. And Ella, if you want to go ahead and come up, she's with her mom, Diana, here tonight. But I've got a funny story about this. So with it being a crazy COVID year, I had asked the art, I told the art teachers just to send me any um, holiday card submissions that they had had. And I pulled out the, all the ones that we had had in the past. And um, and I let the central, I put them out to vote. And so there were two cards that were tied. And so I had them laying there and I turned them both of, both of them over and they were both Ellis. One was from when she was in, the, in elementary school and one from high school. So either way, it didn't matter. She was gonna be our winner. So um, it's been a, a crazy year, but for her, she was the 2020 Mardi Gras poster winner and now the holiday winner for the school system. So we are very proud of you, Ella. And, and, and we are giving her her frame print over here and 25 holiday cards and a check. Thank you. If you want to go over there, we'll take your picture. <laughs> <laughs> Just go on up there and take it. Just walk up there go ahead. and take it. If you want to take a picture. Yeah. <laughs> well, she's obviously talented. She's won two or three of the contests. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Next on our agenda, we have our audit report from Anderson, Smith, and Wyke, their representative. Good evening. Good evening. Hope everyone's doing well. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Andy Deal. I'm a partner with the accounting firm Anderson, Smith & White, and we're here to present the audited financial statements for the year ended June 30th, 2020. And I apologize, you don't have the nice bound uh, financial statements. I'll be honest, I put too much faith in the post office last week, so um, <laughs> that is that is why you don't have them. But they, you know, they should get to the district tomorrow, which I realize does us no good tonight. So I, I do apologize for that. Um, we do have a copy though, so that's all right. Yep, that's good. Yep, and I think there's a the PDFs up there too. So. Right. Um, I'm just going to be brief tonight. I, I know you, uh, you all have a lot to do with everything going on this year. I'm, I'm sure there's a, a lot for you guys to, to address and handle. Um, so I'll be as quick as possible. If anybody has any specific questions, feel free to stop me. If I you know, go too fast, feel free to slow me down. Um, we will start on page one tonight. 
Um, on page one, we have our first auditor's report. Um, there's four auditor's reports in these financial statements. You have one on the financial statements, and then the other three are compliance related. So this report here is on whether the financial statements are in accordance with GAAP, and um, we are pleased to report that this is an unmodified opinion. Uh, an unmodified opinion, you could also call that a clean report. Um, that means we didn't note anything that would cause us to modify our audit opinion. So, you know, pleased to report for the year ended June 30th, 2020, we've got an unmodified clean opinion. Um, next, if you'll flip over to page 14. On page 14 here, um, this is your balance sheet for the governmental funds. So this is going to be all your funds at the district except for the child nutrition fund. The child nutrition fund has a little bit different accounting rules, so their statements are presented uh, in another part of the financial statements. But um, again, the balance sheet for your governmental funds is a very important uh, statement for a school district. This is going to you know, show you your assets and liabilities as of June 30th, 2020. It's going to show you, you know, how much cash you have, how much fund balance you have as of June 30th, 2020. And then if you flip to the next page, page 15, you've got your statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance for the governmental funds. You could also call this an income statement or a P&L profit and loss. Um, this is going to show you all your revenues and expenses for all the governmental funds. Um, if you look at the first column here on page 15, third number from the bottom is going to show you your net change in fund balance for the general fund. So for the year end of June 30th, 2020, we had about a $430,000 decrease in fund balance for the general fund. Um, you know, that, that is not uncommon, uh, you, know, we, you know, just across the state. You know, we're seeing a lot of districts lose fund balance. It's just with the rising cost of like personnel and benefits, it's just real hard to, to add to that fund balance. Um, one thing I would suggest in, in years to, uh, or not years to come, but see your ending fund balance on the first column here for the general fund. The ending fund balance is about 2.9 million, just under 2.9 million. Um, you know, we would recommend trying to grow your fund balance as much as possible. Just due to the pandemic, you know, we're afraid there's going to be cuts at pretty much every level, state, federal, local. You know, if, if you shut the economy down for however long, you know, there, there's going to be less tax revenues. And, you know, you know, we wouldn't be surprised to see cuts, not necessarily this year, but next year and the year after. So, you know, we would recommend growing your fund balance, you know, um, you know, as much as you can. Um, if you look at the, the second column on, on this page, scroll up to the top there. State public school fund, second column. Total revenues for the state public school fund are $46 million. So if they cut that by 5%, that's about 2.3 million. So say you get a 5% cut at the state level, that's $2.3 million. And your ending fund balance is $2.9 million. So that fund balance is there to kind of, you know, the larger that is, the more blow you can withstand as far as cuts at the federal and state level. So just one thing we recommend to all our districts is, you know, try to grow that fund balance as much as possible. We realize it's tough, um, but that's, that's just our, you know, our advice because, you know, I'm afraid there is going to be cuts in the coming, coming years. May I ask one question right there? Yeah. <clears throat> now, when you say grow it, uh... Are they a certain percentage as an accountant looking at numbers all the time? Are they a certain percentage you would think that the fund balance needs to stay at in your professional opinion? Or would it just be you want to make sure like a three month, four month running? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, we get that question a lot. It's a great question. It's hard to just say, you know, here's the percentage or here's the dollar amount because every district's different. Every district gets a different amount of county funding and, and local funding and, and local grants, you know, from nonprofits and maybe just individuals. So it, 
it's hard for me to say your fund balance needs to be here and you'll be healthy. Uh, my advice would be just, it definitely, in my opinion, needs to be higher than it is now. Just like I said, if you, if you get a 5% cut at the state, you know, the only thing you can do other than wipe out your fund balance is just cut. And, and to be honest, there's probably been a lot of cuts made the past few, you know, you know, you, you can only cut so much, but it, it's a great question. And I, like I said, I wish you, um, I wish I could give you like a percentage or a dollar, but just off the top of my head, that that's just real tough to give just, just an exact amount. Um, and you know, we can sit here and say it needs to be this and that, but being honest, like, you know, you've got to have support from your county commissioners. You've got to have, you know, just, um, you know, the district just kind of to buy in to, to grow that fund balance or, or it makes it really tough. And, and honestly, just the rising benefit costs, like healthcare costs, pension costs, I mean, it, it makes it really tough because you've got less employees now and more employee costs, even with less employees. So, I mean, it, it's just, it, it makes it hard. But um, I know that's not the answer you wanted, but it... Well, well, that's all right. That sort of really did answer my question, believe yeah. it or not, because I knew they, it was just one of those things we have always tried to keep our fund balance. And you've been here long enough, you've seen it. We've yeah. always tried to keep our fund balance at a good level, but sometimes, yeah. sometimes we just don't know the right amount yeah. But we, I, I like a healthy fund balance. Yeah. But sometimes we get told to use it pretty often. Yeah. We, Thank you. <laughs> we see we see that often too. So yeah. you're not unusual in that. I got a question uh, along the lines of Mr. Kirkpatrick. Um, a district our size, what are you typically seeing as an average fund balance for a district our size? Are we are we about average or are we a little less than what average? I would say you're a little less than average. I'm not going to say you're like you know, way below average. I, I would say maybe for a district your size, because you, you guys aren't small. You know, you're not big, but you're not small either. And I, I would say for a district your size, maybe a little below average, but I, it, it's kind of, especially the rural districts, we're just seeing them really bleed fund balance. So maybe it's more average now um, after the, you know, the past couple years, very few districts, especially rural districts have added to their fund balance. So you know, we're seeing at pretty much all of our, um, you know, rural districts, low fund balances and, and losing fund balances. Some of them did better this year with the stimulus money. Um, some of them didn't. Um, I, I would say a few of them did better. Most of them didn't. But, um, yeah, I, I would say just, just for your size, it, it's probably a little below average to average. Okay. So. Um, the next thing we'll go over is on page 23. So got some good news here to talk about. Um, on page 23, we have the statement of cash flows for the school nutrition fund. Um, one good, you know, one thing we look at to see, you know, how well financially a school nutrition department is doing is how much cash did they make. Due to the accounting rules, uh, Fund 5 or school, the School Nutrition Fund, they have to record all these crazy liabilities for the pension fund, the, the retirement health care fund, and um, you know other stuff like that. So it, it really makes it hard to look at the balance sheet and income statement and see what they did because of all the pension plan stuff. Um, but on the uh, statement of cash flows, it, it makes it pretty easy to see, you know, did they make cash, did they lose cash? You know, if a if a school nutrition program keeps losing cash year over year, then your general fund basically just has to bail it out, and that makes it harder to add to that fund balance that we just talked about. And here at Haywood County Schools, I think historically the past few years, they've uh, it's been really hard on them to, to grow their cash balance. They've been losing cash, and um, this year, if you look at the third number from the bottom, the net increase in cash was just under $300,000 and their beginning cash was, you know, just over 200,000. So, I mean, they more than doubled their cash and, um, you know, that, that's a great sign. Um, you know, that to me, that just shows that, that they, you know, use their funds wisely and, and were very diligent about trying to grow that cash balance, which I, I think they have been for, 
the past several years. Um, so, you know, that, that's great news. And I'll be honest, we don't see that much at all. Like that big of an increase in cash, um, that, is, that is rare to see, especially in mountain districts. You know, the transportation cost through the mountains is more, um, and, and the rural districts, it, it makes it tough. So, you know, that is, that is a great sign they're increasing cash there. Um, the next thing we'll go over is on page 65. On 65, this is where the compliance portion of the audit starts. Um, there are three auditor's reports for compliance. Um, the first one here, this is on internal control over financial reporting and internal control over compliance. Um, we did have one finding related to this report. Um, the school food service fund was over budget for the fiscal year into June 30, 2020. And anytime you're over budget, anytime they're over the board approved budget, that's a finding. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that more later, but you know, nothing here except the, uh, the school nutrition fund was over budget. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second in more detail. Um, if you flip over two more pages, page 67, this is our report on compliance with federal programs. And this report, we had no findings. It's an unmodified report or a clean report. So that is good news. And if you flip over two more pages, page 69, this is our report on compliance with the major state programs. And again, this is a clean report, an unmodified report, um, which is good news. Um, if you flip to page 73, that is where um, the, the finding is noted. Um, like I said before, the, the school food service fund, uh, they, their expendit expenditures or expenses exceeded the board approved budget. And um, like I said, that is a finding. Um, one thing I'll say, you know, this isn't unusual and especially for fiscal year 20 with the pandemic they had way more activity in June than they've ever had before, just getting the meals out to folks. And, and just, there was a lot of stuff that happened in June, um, you know, that, that's never happened before. So it just, it, long story short, it made it hard to budget for all the expenditures um, just because, you know, they just hadn't really been through that before. And, and another thing too, we see this, normally if a district goes over budget, it's in fund five, because like I said, Fund five has different accounting rules. So all of their internal reporting is on like a full accrual basis, whereas budgets are on cash basis. So it, it makes it really tough. Even, you know, I'm a CPA, even for me, it makes it really tough to kind of do that cash to accrual adjustment. So you can take, you know, their numbers and put them on budget numbers. So that just kind of muddies the water even more. Um, so like I said, you know, this isn't something that, um, you know, we see this a lot where districts go over budget and fund five. So it, it's not, you know, it is a finding, but it's, it's nothing that's out of the ordinary. Um, that's all I have on the financial statements. Um, one thing I do want to talk about, um, you know, one thing we're required to do is if we have difficulties in completing the audit, we're re required to communicate those difficulties to the board. Um, just through the auditing standards that you know that's a requirement um, as always we had no difficulties in, in getting our audit done um, I would also just you know like to thank the finance department and, and every department at the you know Haywood County Schools but especially the finance department as everybody knows they had a ton of stuff go against them this year um, Angie retired Leanna got sick you know Bob you know he, he did what he could but he was in and out of the hospital but, you know, with all that said, we still got the statements done by the extended due dates. I mean, they're not late or anything like that. We did have one finding, but just given everything that happened in 2020, you know, I, I, you know, I can't thank them enough for just, you know, getting us what we needed to do to complete the audit. And, um, you know, I, I'll be honest, I thought it was going to be a lot worse with, with everything that, that's happened here, you know, with, with Leanna and, and, 
involved. It is 2020. And, and, and it's 2020. <laughs> and, you know, I, you know when, when we left the field that week, you know, I, I called Dr. Nolte and I was just tickled pink. I was like, you know, I, I'll be honest, I thought it was going to be worse than it was. And um, it, it wasn't that bad at all. And I, I just, I would really like to thank the finance department and, um, you know, Nathan and, and everybody in there. They, you know, if we asked for stuff, they got it to us. And, and a lot of them are new at what they're doing. And they just, they had a great attitude and just, you know, they weren't going to give up. So, you know, we, we really appreciate that on our end. So that, that helps. So just just want to add that. But um, other than that, that's all I have to present tonight, unless somebody has questions or anything like that. Anybody have questions, comments? Thank you. Yep. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Y'all have a good rest of your year. All right. Uh, Mr. Francis, members of the board, staff and guests, uh, it is my pleasure um, to announce that North Carolina each year is allowed to nominate one principal from the state to uh, be in the running for the National Association of Secondary School Principals. And we have that principal and we are so proud to introduce Lori Fox to you. I think uh, Lori is, has uh, logged on um, to uh, make a comment or two, and um, we'll let her do that at this time. And if she doesn't, then I'll make a comment or two about her. And Lori knows it's probably better if she logs in. But we, we are really, really proud of her. She was our regional principal of the year and is now the state's one and only nominee for the National Secondary Principals Award. Thank you, Dr. Nolte. Can you hear me? Yes. I just yes. want to thank everyone uh, for this award. It's definitely not an individual award. When a principal gets recognized, it's a, it's a team award and it's representative of many different people. But I just want to say um, Haywood Early College is a special place. And I am so thankful for the hard work and the commitment from our students and faculty on a daily basis to continue to work hard and they value education. And we are definitely growing during this time period. And I, I just couldn't be prouder uh, to be their principal. And then just a big thank you to the many mentors. Many are sitting in that room tonight and several other ones. Um, who have taught me how to be a leader and they didn't just invest their time and effort, but they lived and they led and I was able to take um, some good notes and try to emulate them. And then uh, thirdly, just to brag on our, our current group of principals, I've had the opportunity to be around some great principals lately and I can't say enough about what's at home in Haywood County. So I'm just thankful to get to represent um, our principals in our district and the middle and high school principals across North Carolina and the secondary principal of the year award ceremony. Thank you. Congratulations, Ms. Fox. I know that uh, I'm sure you may have a, a parent that might get a little bit of credit once in a while, but oh, Lord. I wouldn't give him too much. <laughs> I'll give him what he deserves. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations, Miss Fox. Thank you all. We are very proud of you. Thank you awesome. very, very much. That's unbelievable. Thank you, Dr. Nolte. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Congratulations. May I introduce the next one? Yes, sir. Uh, board members, uh, we had uh, Dr. Mark Jabin come and speak at our um, work session. We know that they're are probably about 50 people streaming in right now listening, which is a substantially higher number than we had at the work session. Dr. Jabin, uh, Dr. Putnam introduced him at the work session. He is our uh, medical director for Haywood County. He has been a friend, been a friend of the school system during COVID. He uh, met with our teachers uh, in large group early in the year. He's met with many small groups. He uh, is our go-to person to call, uh, and when I say we call him, Dr. Putnam calls him, but he has been very, very helpful, and we appreciate him coming uh, back tonight just to 
uh, lead us into our discussion um, about COVID and uh, what's going on in schools uh, as he did the other evening. Thank you, Dr. Jabin. Thank you, Dr. Nolte. Um, I guess when we were here all together Thursday evening, um, we were talking about the surge in cases that we've seen in Haywood County really in the last month. Um, and I think that's not news to anybody. Um, I think that uh, what we're now seeing in the last week or so is the bump from Thanksgiving. And since I was here on Thursday, um, we have added somewhere between 100 and 150 cases in the county. And just for some perspective, back in the late summer, early fall, we were adding like 20 cases a week. So you can kind of get a sense of that. Um, back then it was taking us a month or more to add the next 100. We've added the next 100 in the last three days. So that's just sort of, um, I think, kind of says it all in terms of where we are in the county. How I think that affects the school system, um, which by the way, uh, the school system has done really, I think, a very good job of trying to put practices and policies in place. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. Trying to herd kids and keep them distanced and masked and separate is, is an impossible task. Um, and I don't think that any of us would say that it's been done absolutely to the, to the letter. But what it has accomplished is, and Trevor, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but at least up until this last week, although there were cases in the school, uh, there was no evidence of any transmission in the school. Does that still, still be the case? Um, as the prevalence grows, however, that's going to be a hard standard to, to maintain. I can tell you that uh, over the week this morning, uh, when the staff walked in, there were 100 plus new cases on the desk. What I think is a little bit different now, as opposed to even a week ago, is how many of those involve students and teachers and staff. So I'm not sure where this is going to go right now, but I think we knew from the very beginning that cases in the school system were much more likely to come in from outside than to originate in the school. And I think that we have certainly seen that, and now we're seeing it uh, play out uh, as part of the surge that we're seeing overall. I think uh, if I had an explanation for why that's happening now, I think that uh, because we have a, had a low prevalence, relatively speaking, in the county for, for quite a long time, people have gotten used to behaving in a certain fashion. And I think many, many, many people are doing their best to try to um, follow the public health guidelines in terms of distancing, washing hands, avoiding crowds, um, wearing masks. Uh, it's hard to wear a mask all the time, and it's hard to wear a mask everywhere you go. And what we see repeatedly are people who contract COVID, who have tried to be really careful, but the one time they weren't, bingo, that was the time. And I think as people have had more and more experience over the last few months, maybe I'll let it slide here, I got by okay. Uh, I think the human nature is such that we just sort of start to assume that we're always going to get by okay. And that probably worked uh, because there wasn't as high a prevalence. And so if you went somewhere, chances of bumping into somebody were much lower. And I think we're past that now. Uh, I think there's enough in the county that um, trying to skate by uh, isn't going to be as successful as it might have been up until the last, the last month. This does pose a problem, obviously, because if you have lots of staff out on quarantine, it becomes hard to run your school. Uh, as kids are out, then parents need to be out because if the kids are little, it's hard to leave little kids at home. So it starts to affect the workplace environments as well. So the whole thing just sort of starts to snowball. Um, so my, my plea to, to everyone in the school system, parents who have kids in the school system, as well as people who work in the school system, now is a time to be consistent. Consistent about the practices that you've been doing um, in your home, when you go out, um, and at, at work. I don't know what else we... Do we want to go through some of the stuff we talked about the other night, or...? Uh, uh, maybe just see if the board has additional yeah. questions. Yeah, please. Anyone have questions for Dr. Jabin? Like you said, we went over a lot of information Thursday night, and uh, I would urge people that are 
did not get to stream it the other night. When it gets up on the website, whether it's up on the YouTube channel yet or not, I don't know. But there's a lot of good information that we could, you can garner from that YouTube. I do want to. I, I do want to just comment on one thing that we did talk about, um, because I know everybody is aware of the CDC guidance that came out in terms of length of quarantine, um, and I spent a fair bit of time on the phone today talking with some folks about that. Um, and and mostly, I want to comment on that in light of what we are having to do at the health department just to keep our heads above water, which is we've had to modify what we have been doing up to now. We've been contact tracing. We've been, been case investigating and following all of the people who are positive in the county through to their time of clearance. And we have been following all the people who we've asked to be in quarantine as well. And just the sheer volume of this has made it absolutely impossible unless we just want to send our staff to the loony bin because they go crazy. Um, and so we've had to make some modifications, which include we're not following quarantine people in, that have been asked to be in quarantine like we were before. This does not affect the school system because the school nurses have been doing much of that work all along, and they will continue doing that work all along. Where it will impact people, perhaps, is in what happens when somebody gets symptoms, gets tested, is positive. That's where it may be a problem because there's now a lag there. Um, so what I would also make a plea to people is, if you have suggestive symptoms, if you think that you're gonna go get tested, it is really important that you isolate at that point not to wait till a test result uh, to isolate or not. Isolate at that point and identify people who you think may be a close contact to you. So if you develop symptoms on a Wednesday, you want to go back two days beforehand and consider anybody who has met the criteria for close contact. That's within six feet for more than 15 minutes not wearing a mask. If, you, if there are people that you've been around that might meet those criteria, call them up, say, hey, I've now got symptoms, my kid's got symptoms, you probably ought to be quarantined and be careful till we know for sure. And then once, if that result is a positive result, call them back and say, hey, it is positive, you need to be in quarantine, you need to get tested about six days after your exposure. These are things that we have been talking to people about um, for the health department, but we just cannot keep up with that right now. So we're asking the community to take some ownership of doing those things that they maybe before relied on a call from us to do. There's going to be a lot about this in the paper and through the media. And so I just want to add that message because that does, that does change that. Um, the CDC quarantine changes. This has been mis in, misinterpreted somewhat. As we talked about the other night, quarantine period is still 14 days. There are some options in the CDC guidance to rather than have to do that whole 14 days separate from the world, uh, separate from your family, uh, there are some options to make that separation part shorter, but it still requires the person to be mass distance, good hand washing all the way through that full 14 days. And I said this the other night, we've had a public service worker tested on day five, no, no symptoms, was a close contact, never had symptoms. They, they got tested on day five, that test came back negative. They were released on day eight following that CDC guidance. Day 11, they got sick and got really sick. So that's just an example of it doesn't, the quarantine period, the incubation period is still 14 days. So um, that's, that's what it is. The school system as well, those people are all being followed. The school nurses are doing that. So again, nothing really changes for the school system in terms of the modifications we've had to make at the health department. So I just wanted to get that out there to people as well. You briefly touched on it just for... You briefly touched on it, but just for greater clarity's sake, 14 days will be our, our quarantine period uh, because CDC guidance, current CDC guidance, gives those additional or shorter term options for non-congregate settings. Yeah, thank you, Trevor, for bringing that up. And, and when the CDC put those out, they said that places like long-term care facilities, jails, et cetera, where people are on top of each other, that for sure those should stay 14 days separated. Um, and, and, we, and I think the, the, letter, the spirit of that is that if you work or in a place that people are in close proximity all the time, uh, that would be considered congregate and we should probably follow that to be safer. You know, if you have a workplace and, you know, you have, I use the example that I'm not of a surveyor, uh, sends employees out to the field to, to survey things. That person's not around a whole lot of other people. That's a situation where you could 
potentially invoke one of those other options. But we, I think, in our discussions, feel like the school system, schools are a congregate, they're not a congregate living facility, obviously, but they're a congregate facility. And we've had such a good track record so far in terms of spread inside the school, uh, you know, why, why, why change that at this point? Yeah. Thank you. Right. Happy to entertain any other questions? Any other questions? Not a question, but just to thank you for your availability. I know from, uh, uh, from a community standpoint as well as a school board standpoint, you've made yourself extremely available for questions and, and clarifications, and I do appreciate that. Well, I, I thank you a lot for saying that, Bobby. I, you know, I think this all is so confusing. There have been so much, many changes along the way. And I think, as I think it was Dr. Nolte the other night said, uh, we've never been here before. Um, I think having, having that, be able to have these conversations is just so critical um, to help people try and figure out how to muddle their way through this, and, and we're the same. So I appreciate you saying that. Any others? Thank you so very much, Dr. Javen, for coming once again. I'm happy to do it anytime, and, and thanks for the work that all of y'all are doing, and happy holidays. Amen. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Dr. Nolte. Again, special thanks to Dr. Javen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, we spent um, not quite two hours, I think, the other night talking about um, COVID and um, legitimate concerns from our students and parents and uh, teachers and other staff persons, uh, possible schedules. And I just want to do a very brief survey for people who maybe did not a survey review for people who maybe did not see the survey that we published on Thursday night or were not listening in last Thursday. So uh, in order to gather information for the second semester, we uh, emailed uh, every student on November the 17th with a school system email that's uh, just under 7,000 students. We emailed every employee with a school system email um, that's we have about 1,100 employees, so I'm going to say probably uh, in the neighborhood of nearly a thousand folks asking them to help us with this survey. We um, posted a link to the survey and announced that on our website, and we pushed it to social media, and we asked that folks return that information by the fourth, so we could process it and share it with you and the community. I thought we had a pretty good return, uh, nearly 2,600 responses, I think 2,596. There were a few questions on the survey that we did not share because there was a lot of consistency across, across the uh, major participant groups. Those were about communication, and it seems that our students and Teachers and parents all agree that there's a good bit of communication going on between school and home, and they all know the way that that happens. And we were just really pleased with those responses. Those were the same types of questions that we used in the survey prior to school starting. Uh, the other thing that I want to just thank people for is all the feedback that we received in addition to the survey. Some of that was before the survey. Uh, asking us if, if we might not do another survey, and we were thinking about it, but it's strongly encouraging us to do that. Uh, like me, I know many of you have received text and phone calls and letters and uh, written statements from people, and we value that uh, very, very much, and we receive that from a lot of different people. Just real quick on the survey, uh, the first part of the survey were demographic items. We had 399 classroom teachers respond, which is a large proportion. We have about a little over 500 that responded to the first survey, so a good proportion of our classroom teachers. 921 students, uh, 1,113 parents. We asked them, you know, what their, their assignments were or what their learning models were, 
and then we ask them a few questions to get um, at their concerns about schedules and about safety. So the first question that we ask uh, really to students was how, how do you learn best? And really uh, two thirds of them said in person, which I thought was pretty interesting. We asked uh, teachers, students, and parents uh, how they believe students should learn during COVID-19. And those um, survey indicators were spread across three options, remote only, blended, and all in person. All three of the major groups, teachers at 46.8%, students at 37.89%, and parents at 56.15% indicated in-person learning. So we thought that was pretty telling. We specifically asked them about plan A and B because we know we're going to provide remote only learning throughout the remainder of the year. Not only do we want to do that for people who want that option, but it's a requirement from the state. And so we also know that right now we have plan A available for elementary and plan B available for secondary and we asked them what they thought about that. I think as a board, you all are considering, you know, what's the general plan in second semester, knowing that the situation could get much worse, the governor could uh, offer additional restrictions or close us down. We hope over time that cases will diminish and we'll have fewer cases of weeks or months down the road and we might have more freedom, but in general, I think that's what you're considering. So under plan A, uh, we ask what should that plan look like if we have the plan, uh, plan A opportunity. Uh, again, spread over three options in person, five days a week, in person four days a week, or blended under plan A. Teachers, 34.8% picked four days instead of five. Students were really evenly split on either end of the continuum, which I thought was interesting. 32.5 uh, and 32 point almost seven for five days a week or blended. So they really ran the gamut there in their responses. And those are mainly middle school and high school students responding to the survey. And then parents under plan A were pretty pretty uh, consistently requesting at 52.83% five days in person. And then we ask about plan B. And so the options there were the uh, five days per week, every other week, like we're doing currently with middle school and high school, uh, a two one two model where one group is there two days uh, there's a remote learning day in the middle and uh, the other group is on two days. And then we had heard a lot of people talk to us, teachers in particular, who were saying on plan B, we really would like to have each student each week. Um, but we also heard some people saying they wanted students in front of them as much as possible. And so we gave this option of a three days on, two days off each week for the A and B groups. Uh, that was not a very popular option. Uh, Jill Barker's very often reminds me it's never one thing. So I think that's a combination of uh, not understanding the option or uh, thinking about managing that as a teacher or a parent. Uh, the uh, greatest responses were from teachers was two days on one day off and two days on at 62.7%. 62 .7%. And then students and parents uh, under plan B, uh, the largest response for students and parents was five days each week, like we're doing now, week on, week off. 48.32 for students and 48.61 for parents. I thought that was really interesting because the students are primarily middle and high school students responding, and the parents who responded, for the most part, had elementary children. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And then we, uh, we asked 
the safety question and we simply lifted the safety question mm -hmm. that we used back prior to the first semester that asked about public health regulations, uh, disinfecting schools, sanitizing materials being available, the use of protective equipment, child care, adjusting to school, bus transportation, having in-person interactions, um, someone in the family being medically compromised. And then I added one item, uh, which was, you know, I really don't have a lot of concerns. And the, the biggest difference between these responses and the responses that we received prior to the first semester is they seem to be more evenly distributed. Certainly there were concerns in all of those areas. Uh, back at the beginning of the year, there were um, about three areas that were much larger than the others. So that's a summary. Again, I, I did that primarily tonight for folks who maybe didn't get to hear the conversation, the long conversation that we had on Thursday. Um, and at this point in time, board, I just um, defer to you to uh, carry on additional conversation or um, address the survey results or other feedback that you've received. I'd just like to make the comment that we did receive, each board member did receive a letter and some survey results from our local Haywood County Associations of Educators. We've got that information in front of us. Just want to make that a public comment. And uh, I appreciate you doing the survey and, and what we've done so far. Been, I know, a challenge for a lot of folks, but I appreciate all the, the work and trying to get the survey put together and everything. You don't have any questions or comments? Okay. Okay. Anything else on this subject? Okay. Carry on then. Mr. Chairman, I don't hear a, um, a change of discussion from you all. I'm wondering if um, if we don't change what we're doing right now, if we might add maybe an additional remote day per month um, for uh, teachers. We know that they have really uh, been getting after it. Some of our early test scores look really, really good. Um, you know, and that's not the only indicator, but that looks really good. We know, too, from looking at failure rates that we described briefly on Thursday that the students who are in person seem to be doing better than the ones um, every day, better than the ones that are remote only. So uh, with your permission, if you're not making other changes, I would request that we add a remote learning day in January and one in February and one in March and one in April, maybe um, spreading them across the A and B rotations and then announcing those. Okay. I think we just need to make a motion to that effect. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a motion to that effect that looking at the results, like you say, they, they need those extra time to help plan and uh, do grading and everything according to the survey and the results. And, uh, we want to give them all the opportunities they can again thanking them for their great work but anyway that's not part of the motion no, I will make the motion that we do adopt the extra uh, remote learning days thank you say with Dr. Rogers the motion was made by Mr. Rogers say with Dr. Rogers any question or discussion on the motion on the floor there being none we'll vote all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carries unanimously Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, board members. We will confer uh, in in the superintendent's office and get that uh, those days out prior to the break, uh, hopefully prior to the end of the week. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we have Miss Jenny Wood on the calendar. Looks like the calendar might change again. <laughs> Looks like it's going to, <laughs> but that's okay. So I'm just going to talk to you about the remote learning work days. And I know we, we spent some time on Thursday going over this, but just for um, if there's any more questions and just for some more clarification. So the revised calendar law 
mandated us adding five remote learning workdays into the current calendar that we had with the option to add five more. So that's what we just did. Um, we took four of those existing optional workdays that we already had scheduled and one early release day, and we assigned those as the five remote learning workdays. Um, remote learning workdays are instructional days, and we do count those hours. They are not snow makeup days. However, we can swap them, which is what we did on December 1st, where we took a uh, previously scheduled remote learning work day and just flip-flopped it with a regular instructional day. So um, we will give 48 hours notice to teachers when we uh, uh, are going to call a remote learning work day, and that is in order for the students to have assignments at home to front-load assignments. Um, no instructional days have been added or taken away and replaced with remote learning work days. Remote assignments on those days may not always be digital assignments, um, but all students, K-12, all students should expect assignments on remote learning work days. Teachers are not required to um, do Google Meets or meet with students on remote learning work days because those are optional teacher work days. So they do not have to provide any online instruction. And like I said, they are um, optional teacher work days, so employees can take accumul accumulated appropriate leave. And um, just to remind everyone that our calendar is driven by instruction and our employees work, our certified employees work 215 contracted days around that instructional time. Um, and that, in, that consists of holidays, annual leave days, work days, and instructional days. Do you guys have any more questions about the remote learning work days? Thank you for clarifying that and getting everything a little more understandable. For yes, sir. Okay, any other questions, comments? Thank you, Ms. Wood. I assume Ms. Shipman is coming in remotely, is that correct? Okay. Ms. Shipman, you're on. Thank you, Chairman Francis. Good evening, board members. Um, I am just really excited to have received a grant for our after school program. This grant is for $56,700. It is from Dogwood Health Trust, and I will be working with our after school directors and our principals to get some materials and technology and just um, supplies that our programs need. So um, we have great after school programs in our county and I know that childcare is much needed for our families and this grant will help us continue to provide a high quality um, environment for all of our after school students. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shipman. That's good news. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it's always good to get a grant that'll help us in the area that we need help. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Putman, you're up. Mr. Kirkpatrick has given me the stuff. <laughs> yeah, I like move along, so I'm <laughs> minding well here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, did want to make, make you aware of the most recent draft of conference realignment. The High School Athletic Association basically uh, recently decided to use a three-factor um, identification system for classifying 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, and they did so in an even fashion of 25% for each classification. That said, looking at the first draft, I'm happy to report that it looks like we will be in conference 54, both schools, Pisgah and Tuscola, East Henderson, Franklin, North Henderson, Pisgah, Smoky Mountain, Tuscola, and West Henderson. So uh, I wanted to share that information. Again, it is first dra draft and preliminary, but um, now that they've provided it to us, Dr. Nolte and I would be hard pressed to let go. We're like a dog on a bone at this point. So. It's been a long, hard struggle, and we're pleased with the first draft. We are, too. Yes. We want to see that rivalry continue and 
have even more meaning than it does already. Back to the days when we were in the same conference, and now we will be if this goes through. We're excited about it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Ms. King, did anyone sign up to address the board during open session? Thank you, ma'am. Board members, you've had an opportunity to look at the November 5th, November 9th, closed session minutes, November 9th and November 16th, regular and called open session minutes. I need a motion. Motion to approve. Mr. Ronnie Clark has made a motion, seconded by Mr. Dr. Rogers. Any questions or discussion on the motion on the floor? Being none, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, next we have Miss Brandy. Miss Stevenson, I assume she's coming in remotely today. I am. Okay. Cameron Francis, members of the board, tonight I bring to you an agreement to host a student that is in the program to get her master's degree in occupational therapy. This is a um, staff member that left us um, as a teacher to go get her master's in occupational therapy, and she's coming back to us um, to do her internship. So um, I bring this to you for approval tonight. Okay. Any questions for Ms. Stevenson before we have a motion or anything? Okay. I need a motion for approval. I make a motion that we approve the uh, agreement that Ms. Stevenson just Okay. Yeah. We have a motion from Mr. Kirkpatrick. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Hey, Mr. Francis, any questions or discussion on the motion on the floor? There being none, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Stevenson. Be safe. Thank you so much. All right. Next we have Ms. Barker. Chairman Francis, members of the board, on Thursday night, I brought to you our district improvement plan proposed for the next two years, and also you have had a chance to preview the school improvement plans. At this time, do you have any questions? I'd like to make a motion we approve the district and school improvement plans as presented. Okay, we have a motion for Mr. Kirkpatrick. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Rogers, any questions or discussion on the motion on the floor? There being none, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Barker. <coughs> Next on the agenda, we are we're going to plan on having a letter possibly to the governor and to our legislative delegation. Um, at this time, I have not been able to uh, have time to put it together. So uh, what I would suggest we do instead of taking action on this tonight is let us come up with the letter, and I'll send it out an email, and then if we don't have any objection to sending it, we'll go from there. Is that okay, board members? It's agreed. Okay. What we're trying to do is ask the governor to let us keep local control of our school system open and closing and what plan we're on and I think that uh, if it's done from a statewide level it doesn't include the local areas and represent us the way we are here in Haywood County and uh, I've had several board members express concerns about that so we'll put something together then we'll tune it up and send it out let everybody look at it and We'll correct it and make it what you would like to see, and then we'll send it, okay? All right. So no action on that item. Next, we have Dr. Putnam. The facility needs. Mr. Chairman, you've been provided a copy of the facility needs survey, and we covered this uh, <laughs> at the work session. Essentially, the facility needs survey. It's a rather lengthy document as he holds it up, um, but it basically evaluates every facility in Haywood County, 
considers the number of students, the age of the building, the amount of square footage inside, the amount of parking square footage, and what it will take to keep or maintain these facilities. It also helps pinpoint your highest uh, areas of need. So it's required of uh, the Department of Public Instruction every five years, and we have completed that survey. And it's uh, before you for signature and return to DPI. Okay. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I would like to make a motion that we approve this uh, facility survey. I uh, know you've read all hundred some pages there, haven't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, we've <laughs> reviewed a lot of that. So thanks to the hard work of everybody in every school and maintenance department, because I know there's a lot of hard work went into that. So. Thank you. All right, we have a motion, Mr. Rogers. Do I hear a second? Second. Except Mr. Kirkpatrick, any questions or comments on the motion on the floor? There being none, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. No, Mr. Rogers, I have not read all 100 and something pages of that. <laughs> but I'm sure Dr. Putnam has. <laughs> I assure you, Dr. Nolte and I both have laid eyes on this as well as all of our maintenance department and our maintenance directors. Just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> Next, we have our policies from Dr. Putnam. Mr. Chairman, we have uh, one policy for first read. It is uh, policy 3420, student promotion and accountability. Uh, this has been vetted through Teresa Cook, who is our, one of our uh, accountability folks, and she has uh, she concurs with the changes. Essentially, the, there's no substantive changes to the policy. It just updates the hyperlinks and information in other resources section. Okay. We'll table that for 30 days for public comment. And then, Mr. Chairman, you have uh, policy 40... 345 uh, student discipline records uh, up for second reading. Uh, I'll make a motion that for the second reading under the policy that uh, Mr. Putnam let us have last month to look over that we should all look have already had the chance to look over for second reading policy 4345 student disciplinary records. 4120 and 3620. I make a motion that we approve them for the second reading. Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Kirkpatrick. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Dr. Rogers. Any questions or comments on the motion on the floor? There being none, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Dr. Putnam. Thank you. Next, we have our building and grounds uh, chair tonight is going to be Mr. Jimmy Rogers. I think they have a couple of items they'd like to bring forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, buildings and ground has met previously, and give me just a moment to bring this up again. Okay. Uh, the buildings and grounds would like to present as a motion to approve the Haywood County Schools Board of Education Central Office interior renovation contract with the PFA Architects, PA, and John Bergen Construction, LLC. Okay. Award their contract. We have a motion from Mr. Rogers. Do I hear a second? Second. Say, Mr. Kirkpatrick. Now. Any question or discussion on a motion on the floor? Now, this is the approval for just the contract that we looked at last month. And so this right here will get the ball going to get the project started up there at the central office. Execution of the contract, yes, right. Mr. Kirkpatrick. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any other questions or comments? There being none, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, we have a, another motion at this time that we would like to approve the funding of the Haywood County Schools Board of Education Center Central Office, the interior renovation, using our existing capital fund balances. I second that motion. Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Rogers, seconded by Mr. Kirkpatrick. Any questions or comments on the motion on the floor? Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a few comments. As we heard before mentioned in our audit report, how we need to 
be holding on to our fund balances and hoping them to gain. Now this is a different fund balance. This is our capital fund balance. It's different than our operating fund balance. So it is two different balances we're talking about here. We're not talking about using our capital fund balances, which is uh, to help our operations of our school system. Uh, this is for capital projects. And uh, that's a comment I like to make and, and uh, right. at this time. Any other questions or comments? There being none, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Okay. We'll ask for a division. All those in favor, raise your hand. All right, there's three. Mr. Henson, you got your hand raised? No, sir. Okay. Opposed? Raise your hand. Motion fails. Okay. Mr. Chairman, that's all the buildings and grounds has tonight. Thank all you. All right. Let's see what's in store in the finance committee. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> all right. Finance committee chair, Mr. Ronnie Clark, you're up. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Francis, we, the finance committee met earlier, and we want, I want to bring the monthly financial reports to the board. Uh, we reviewed everything. Everything looks good. I need to uh, bring it to approval, please. Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Clark. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Mr. Nesbitt, is that correct? That's good. Okay. I thought I heard you. Uh, got you so we have a motion and a second. The financial reports at this time. Are there any questions or comments on the motion on the floor? There being none, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, also, uh, we want to add, uh, the finance department wants to add Amanda Robinson as a part-time employee for 19.5 hours a week to help with special projects through the end, probably till June 30th. Uh, and these projects include W-2s, the supplements, a bonus pay, and uh, there's like 12 a list that she's an expert in that they need help until the finance department is fully Staff. Everybody back and everything. So I'm going to bring us to a motion to uh, hire Amanda Robinson for 19.5 hours a week. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Clark, second Mr. Rogers. Any questions or discussion on the motion on the floor? Just for clarification, I believe that's up to 19 hours, not necessarily she will be working continuously, correct? That's correct. They'll, it'll be project work. She may work that many hours uh, a lot of weeks, but no, certainly not every week. Just want to clarify that. Any other questions or comments? There being none, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, finally, Mr. Chairman, uh, as a recap on what we talked about earlier on the funding for the uh, Central Office Project, the Finance Committee would like to bring that we borrow one million dollars from the uh, commissioners or however through their funding uh, availabilities, whatever it is. Okay. And we will use the rest of the money from the capital uh, funds outlay to finance this project. Okay. We have a motion from Mr. Clark. I hear a second. Second. Second by Dr. Rogers. Any questions or discussion on the motion on the floor? Just a comment. I think this gives us the ability to, uh, to use a phrase we say way too often right now in these uncertain times uh, to know that we have uh, capital expense, fund balance, steady in case of any catastrophic or crippling dilemmas that we may face. Yes, sir. That was going to be my comment. I, I, I'll let you make it. I have a lot. <laughs> well, I have a lot of concern about bringing down a fund balance so far, especially after what we experienced with the floods back in Francis and Ivan days and. We had very little capital money to to try to rebuild before uh, any FEMA money could be brought in. You had to spend it first, but we didn't have any money to spend. So that's my concern, and so I think this 
Uh, if we don't use it, we can send it back. Right. Uh, and we'll, we'll pay it back sooner rather than later, I feel confident. But um, that's my thoughts on it. Any other questions or comments before we vote? There being none, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Aye. Aye. Okay, same three voted against. So Mr. Kirkpatrick, um, Burnett, and Mr. Rogers in the negative. Motion carries. All right, anything else from the Finance Committee? No, sir, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Nolte, personnel. Members of the board, uh, staff and guests, uh, just one side note, we will uh, bring you either at the next board meeting or some other communication a, a start date for Ms. Robinson. We did not discuss that tonight. I know it could start upon your vote, but we'll, we'll bring you that for your information. At this time, I'd like to bring the personnel that we discussed previously in closed session uh, for your information, separation from employment, we have 15. Employee status change is one. And leave of absence, five. For your approval, under employment, we have 13. Under employee status change, we have 38. Under substitute teachers, two. Employee coach, one. Volunteer coach, two. All right, do I hear a motion that we approve the person that was presented? So moved. Mr. Clark's made the motion, second by Mr. Burnett. Any uh, questions or comments on the motion on the floor? There being none, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, board. Thank you, Dr. Nolte. There being nothing else to come before the board, meeting adjourned. <laughs>